Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, this one's been recommended to me several times. And it's called The Odd Details of All Four U.S. Presidential Assassinations. It's from a channel called A Grain of Salt, which I'm not familiar with, but I had emails and some comments from people saying, hey, you should check this one out. A lot of you know that uh, U.S. presidential history is one of my Fortes. It's one of the things I like to talk about the most and probably have done the most videos about uh, on this channel, including one of my own uh, original content about presidents. Uh, so I thought it'd be worth checking out. And uh, he's only got 17 and a half thousand subscribers, uh, a grain of salt. But if you like what you see and want to check out more, it seems like there's quite a variety of things on his channel. I'll put the link down in the description. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Angelique in Gilbertsville, Kentucky, my second favorite state, Kentucky. Most of my family comes from there. Uh, thank you so much, Angelique, for your support on Patreon. Could not do this without you. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. Since it was founded, the United States of America has had 46 presidents. But Grover Cleveland weirdly counts as two because his terms weren't consecutive. So really, there have been 45 people in office. Yeah, and if you think about it, if, uh, you know, regardless of how you feel about politics and the election this fall, uh, if he gets elected again, Donald Trump would be the second president with non-consecutive terms that would get counted twice. Kind of a weird quirk of how we do things. Of those 45 people, four of them have been assassinated during their term. That comes out to almost a 9% assassination rate. But if you think about it this way, the first three happened in a period of 36 years. So really, uh, in that stretch, you have, what, the 16th to the 25th president. Uh, you have 10 men, and three of those 10 were assassinated in that time period. Uh, we've actually gone, I think, one of the longest stretches ever since 1963 without a president dying in office which kind of makes you wonder why people would even want the job. Not to mention the insane amount of pressure, yeah. the life-consuming amount of work, and every single person critiquing your life and choices for yeah, the Yeah, I wouldn't want no time. part of it. But there is a six-figure pension, so maybe it all evens out. Anyway, two of the four presidential assassinations have been incredibly overshadowed by the other two. Yeah, and the other two were the two presidents that are like me from Northeast Ohio, so let's give some love to those other ones. Which have been studied so thoroughly that they're almost boring at this point. But in the interest of inclusivity, I'll just talk about all of them. So please enjoy the odd details of all four U.S. presidential assassinations. The first one was Abraham Lincoln, who was attending a play on April 14th, 1865, when he was shot in the back of the head by John Wilkes Booth an actor and Confederate sympathizer. The Booths were a family of famous actors, yeah. especially John's brother Edwin Booth, who is sometimes regarded as the greatest American actor of the 19th century. Yeah, that's true. And John was kind of always in his brother's shadow, and they would actually often act together. Uh, and Edwin was horrified by what his brother did uh, in the assassination and was comforted, I'm, I'm guessing maybe he'll mention, comforted by the fact that he had once saved the life of Robert Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's son. And less than a year before the there assassination, Edwin Booth actually saved the life of Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert, by pulling him out of a train platform. Robert Lincoln even recognized Edwin Booth, yeah. which must have later been a weird memory for him. That'd yeah. be like if Charlie Sheen saved your life, and then a few months later, your father was shot by Emilio Estevez. Just By the way, this gives me a great opportunity to mention the fact that Martin Sheen is one of the most incredibly kind and gracious human beings I've ever met in my life. If you didn't see my video talking about that when, when we were with him in Gettysburg uh, and got to uh, be a part of some things that he and Sam Waterston were doing, I, I cannot possibly say enough good things about that man. He's very proud of his kids, uh, as he should be. John Wilkes Booth had been planning some mischief for quite a while originally intending to kidnap the president instead. Yep. The plan was to grab Lincoln as he was leaving a hospital. But Lincoln decided not to go to that hospital and instead attended an event at the National Hotel. Which so Lincoln would often go and visit soldiers at the hospitals, and this was well known. And this is a time before the U.S. Secret Service uh, is protecting the president. The president did have some bodyguards. In fact, um, there was a... a company of soldiers sent by Governor David Todd of Ohio uh, to protect the president. And one, one soldier in each of Ohio's counties was chosen to be a part of what was called the Union Light Guard. Uh, they weren't guarding him that day, but they did get stationed at the White House. They would often be used as couriers. But um, yeah, he had nobody guarding his, uh, 
his place at Ford's Theater in that moment. Which happened to be the place that John Wilkes Booth was staying as he plotted the kidnapping. So the two of them swapped locations in some kind of convoluted Looney Tunes gag. A quick sprinkle of comedic relief before we dive into the murder. Booth learned that Lincoln would be attending the play on the morning of the assassination. That's, that's something that I think often gets overlooked is the fact that Booth didn't know Lincoln was going to be there until that morning. But he had already been planning to do this. Uh, it was said that a couple of days earlier, um, first of all, there's a very famous photo of Lincoln giving his second inaugural address, and and Booth is there in the photo. Um, but uh, he heard him give a speech a few days earlier uh, in which Lincoln, for the first time, alluded to giving voting rights to, uh, in particular, black veterans who had served in the Civil War. And Booth turned to the guy that was with him and said, that means N-word citizenship. That'll be the last speech he ever makes. And so at that point, it was pretty clear he was planning on killing him. So he quickly cobbled together a plan to sneak into Lincoln's box and shoot him in the back of the head. Since he was a famous actor, he could pretty much go anywhere in the theater. Yeah. But Lincoln did have a guard with him that night, a man named John Parker, he wasn't there. who was assigned to the job because Lincoln's two usual guards were busy. But during the intermission, John Parker went to a nearby tavern, got drunk, and fell asleep. He later claimed that Lincoln had dismissed him until the end of the play, which is exactly what you might say if the only person who can verify it had just been shot in the yep. head. The play they were watching was called Our American Cousin, a comedy about a goofy American visiting his relatives in England. And Booth was familiar with the play, so he timed the assassination yeah. with a line that he knew would get a big laugh. The line, delivered by actor Harry Hawk, was, Well, I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal, you sock dologizing old, old man trap. trap. And every portrayal you see of Lincoln's assassination in TV and documentaries, you always hear that line. It was right after that, as everybody's laughing, that Booth pulls the trigger. I guess you had to be there. So when that line came around and the entire theater burst into laughter, including Lincoln himself, John Wilkes Booth shot the president in the back of the head. Here's a depiction of the assassination, in which Lincoln seems pretty unbothered by the whole thing. The couple sitting next to the Lincolns is Major Henry Rathbone and his fiance Clara Harris. So it was supposed to be the uh, the Grants, uh, Pre or General and uh, Julia Grant, uh, but they wanted to get back to, to see their kids, who I think were in New Jersey at the time. And Grant gets as far as Philadelphia when he hears about the assassination and needs to turn around and come back. Uh, and also, uh, Mrs. Grant claims that that night as they were leaving the city, uh, that John Wilkes Booth rode up to their carriage and actually like stuck his head inside and looked at them and then rode off. And she swore it was him from that point on. Who were both lovers and step-siblings. But that's a story for another day. Besides the fact that later on, in their lives, Major Rathbone actually murders Clara Harris uh, and then ends up in an insane asylum. Rathbone got up to confront John Wilkes Booth, but Booth whipped out a dagger and stabbed Rathbone in the arm before jumping 12 feet onto the stage, injuring his leg in the process, and then yelling at the crowd, which probably caused at least a couple people in the audience to go, oh, I didn't know he was in this. But once the crowd realized what was going on, the entire theater began chasing Booth. So his... There's a lot of different reports about exactly what happened. Uh, he probably caught the spur that he was wearing on one of his uh, boots on the flag as he jumped, and it kind of threw him off balance. Uh, two things are reported to have been said by Booth. Uh, most people quote the one, which is Six Semper Tyrannus, thus always to tyrants, which is on the Virginia state uh, flag, um, or Commonwealth, I guess, a Virginia flag. Uh, but other people also heard him say the South is avenged. Uh, there's also a report. Um, so General Ambrose Burnside was in the crowd that night. And some people have said that Lincoln was actually looking down at Burnside at the moment that he was shot. He ran out of a side door, stabbing the orchestra leader on his way out. Not sure if the orchestra leader was in the way or if Booth just didn't like the guy. Then he got onto a horse and fled. Lincoln was in serious condition and officially died the next day. So they, um, 
the doctor who initially treats him actually sticks his finger up into the wound and removes a clot, and that actually temporarily saves Lincoln's life. Uh, Lincoln was probably in the moment of dying right there, uh, but removing that clot relieved some of the pressure on his brain and, and bought a few hours, but he was never going to regain consciousness. Too much damage had been done. Ultimately, the sleepy guard John Parker somehow wasn't fired after failing to do the one thing he was required to do. Talk about government job security. You had one job. He was instead fired three years later after he once again fell asleep on the job. But who can blame him? It couldn't possibly end worse than the first time. Interestingly enough, the Lincolns were supposed to be joined by Ulysses yep. S. Grant and his wife Julia. But Julia had beef with Mary Todd Lincoln. So the Grants declined to attend. That was also, yeah, that, I didn't mention that part earlier, but that's definitely true. And Mary Todd Lincoln had beef with a lot of people. Uh, she tended to rub a lot of people the wrong way. Um, and there was a couple of particular incidents where she actually blew up on other women who she thought were like, like, uh, cozying up to her husband and things like that. It was she she dealt with some severe mental illness that only got worse uh, as she suffered not only the murder of her husband but also the death of three of her four sons during her lifetime. Ulysses S. Grant reportedly regretted this for the rest of his life, yeah. believing that he could have overpowered Booth, but that's assuming that he wouldn't have been distracted by the hilarious sockdologizing line. In fact, Major Henry Rathbone ultimately went insane because of his own failure to stop the assassination. Yet somehow the guard who got drunk and fell asleep seemed to move past the whole thing quite quickly. Rathbone later relocated to Germany, where he murdered his wife yep. slash stepsister Clara and stabbed himself five times in the chest. I don't know that there's any connection that's been made between his grief over not being able to stop the assassination and his insanity. I don't know that they're connected, but maybe they are. But he survived the incident and was sent to an insane asylum for the rest of his life. Yeah. When he finally died in 1911, they buried him next to his wife. Can't imagine she would have been thrilled about that. But You know, I have that in my own family. There was an incident. Uh, there's a there's a family in my family tree, My my going back to my great-great-grandfather, uh, where I, I've seen a real pattern through like four generations of mental illness in that family. Uh, and in one generation, it includes a murder-suicide. And, and the guy who murdered his wife and then killed himself, they are buried together. That seems to have been a thing that they still did anyway. Perhaps it's a fitting end to their unconventional love story. As for John Wilkes Booth, he limped around in secrecy for almost two weeks before he was found hiding in a barn. Soldiers surrounded it and told him to come out and surrender, but he refused. So they set the barn on fire and shot him to death. But Booth was not acting alone, as he had a team of co-conspirators who had planned to simultaneously assassinate Lincoln, Vice President Andrew Johnson, and Secretary of State William Seward. So I, since I've already a couple of times said things that then he then said, I'm going to try to wait until he gets through the end of the Lincoln story to cover some of the other aspects of this, just hopefully I won't forget anything. Seward's assassin successfully broke into his house and stabbed the Secretary of State in the neck. But Seward was recovering from a jaw injury, so he had a splint on his neck that protected him from the stabbing. Yeah, it actually had like metal on it, and, and uh, he hit the thing several times. He actually, he, he went to the door of the house claiming he was delivering some medication and then kind of, you know, pistol whipped or something. Um, uh, Seward's son and made his way up to the room. Meanwhile, the guy assigned to kill Andrew Johnson simply got drunk at a bar and decided against it. Yep. Although considering the goal of the conspirators was to bring back the Confederacy, leaving Andrew Johnson alive was probably in their best interest. <sighs> yeah. All of the conspirators were eventually rounded up and tried, with four of them being sentenced to hanging. One of them, Mary Surratt, was actually the first woman ever executed by the United States government. How about that? Yeah, and, and there's some evidence. I mean, there's debate about how much she knew and how, how much guilt she had. I think she probably was aware of what they were planning in her boarding house. Uh, but it's also pretty clear that they were really trying to get to her son, John, who had ex escaped to Canada and then eventually made his way to the Vatican uh, and eventually 
came back and really didn't face any punishment because things had kind of worn off by then. But this was a military tribunal. Uh, it was hardly a fair trial that was given to any of them. Even Samuel Mudd, the guy that set Booth's leg, got life in prison that was eventually commuted. I guess Lincoln really was a president of progress. Well, that story took a long time. So uh, a couple of other things about this. There was a recent TV show that was on Apple TV uh, called Manhunt. Uh, and while it I, I think it plays fast and loose with a lot of conspiracy theories. I think there are some really good elements to it. Um, I, I think uh, Anthony Boyle is the name of the actor who was also in Masters of the Air who plays uh, John Wilkes Booth, and I thought he was phenomenal as Booth. I think they do a great job showing the story of uh, Edwin Stanton, who kind of oversaw the manhunt, even though they didn't bother to make... Uh, the actor Tobias Menzies look anything like Edwin Stanton. If you can get past the fact he looks nothing like him, and they didn't even try to make him look like him, at least give him a beard or something, uh, I thought his acting was fantastic, and I thought they did a great job telling his story. But the good news is that nobody cares about the next two assassinations, so we can disagree right through them. Disagree. The second president to be assassinated was James A. Garfield. He was shot twice in the back at a railroad station in Washington, D.C. on July 2nd, 1881. The man who shot him was Charles J. Gateau. Just look at his face and tell me you can't tell already that this guy's not playing with a full deck. Because this guy was not playing with a full deck. And we've done an entire video about him, which I'll uh, put a link down in the description and put up on the screen at the end as well. A drifter who was pretty much clinically insane. Now, the YouTuber Sam Onella has done ah, a full video one. on Gateau. Really good which video. I recommend checking out because he's a lot better at this than I am but I'll give you the highlights to show you just how weird Gateau was, even though I think his picture already gives it away. And there's actually a, a TV show coming out about this, too. I think it's on Netflix, uh, and it's going to star Matthew McFadden as uh, Gateau. If you've seen him uh, in Succession uh, or in uh, Ripper Street, fantastic actor, and he's going to play Gateau. In his early 20s, Gateau was a member of a religious society Oneida. known as the Oneida Community. They believed that we could exist in a world free of sin because Jesus returned from the dead in AD 70. I guess he thought a quick 35 years of being dead was enough for everyone to get the point. As part of their sinless community, everyone was basically allowed to have sex with whoever they wanted. Ah, the swinging sinless. 60s. The 1860s, that is. Do you ever notice how often these cults end up involving being allowed to do stuff like that? Like, it's really just an excuse. That's all it is. The only problem for Charles Gateau was that everyone hated him, so he was never allowed to join the Oneida orgies. <laughs> Imagine a community where you can pretty much do what you want, and they still hate your guts. Group's opinion of him culminated in the members of the community calling him Charles Get Out. And you really have to suck if even a sinless utopian society is bullying you. Yeah. So he eventually listened and left the Oneida community. After many other weird life events, Gateau made his way to Washington, D.C., where he began campaigning for James Garfield, who was running for president. And by campaigning, I mean that he wrote one speech in support of Garfield without anyone telling him to, and then handed it out to a couple hundred people on the street. But even that might have been more effective than the entire 2016 Clinton campaign. The speech was originally written for Ulysses S. Grant, who was seeking a third term. But when he lost the nomination to Garfield, Gateau hastily changed the speech so it was in support of Garfield. So Garfield was, uh, he's a young guy, he's one of the youngest presidents ever elected to the office. And uh, he had just been elected a senator from the state of Ohio. He was a longtime congressman at this point, um, Civil War general, incredibly intelligent, one of our, our most intelligent presidents, college professor, only ordained minister who was president. Um, and uh, like I said, a really smart guy. Uh, he was elected uh, at that time. We didn't directly elect senators. That changed in the early 20th century. Uh, so the Ohio legislature had just elected him to be senator, uh, but he never took office because he got elected president. And he wasn't really on anybody's radar screen for president in the 1880 Republican nomination process. He was kind of a compromise candidate, much like Abraham Lincoln was in 1860. Uh, nobody could get their, their guy elected, and so Garfield kind of became the second choice for everyone. He did it so hastily, in fact, that it was actually giving Garfield credit for things that Grant had done. 
but every politician does that now, so maybe Gateau was ahead of his time. When Garfield won the presidency, Gateau was convinced that he- It's a great picture, by the way. You can clearly see Garfield right there. Uh, a lot of people are moving around, but still a fantastic picture that you don't see very often. He was the reason. So he began petitioning the Garfield administration to make him an American consul in Paris. When they yeah, inevitably- dude went out and unsolicited, not hired by the campaign or anything like that, passed out a couple hundred leaflets and then was like, I want you to make me an ambassador to a major country. Hmm. We ignored him, he very logically decided to take revenge by killing Garfield. There's a lot more to the story than that, and, and Salmonella's video does a great job of telling that whole story. So he bought a gun, spent a few weeks in target practice, and then waited for the president to show up at the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station. When Garfield arrived, preparing to board a train and go on vacation, Gateau walked up to him and shot him twice in the back. Interestingly enough, Garfield was accompanied by his Lincoln. Secretary of War, who happened to be Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert, making it both the second President Robert knew being killed and his second traumatizing experience at a train station. And, surprisingly enough, he will be in Buffalo not far from William McKinley in 1901 when McKinley was assassinated. After that, he swore never to attend another presidential event, uh, and he kept that promise until he came to uh, the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial in the early 1920s in the presence of President Warren Harding, who not long after died in office. Unfortunately, Edwin Booth was not there to save another life. Although the president might not have needed saving, he was quickly taken back to the White House where a collection of the nation's best doctors gathered. No lie, if they had done absolutely nothing, if they had just sewed him up and sent him on his way, Garfield would have survived. There's a very, very clear argument to be made that the doctors killed him. But you still have to find the guy guilty because without the bullet, the doctors wouldn't have had the opportunity to kill him. Unfortunately, the nation's best doctors in 1881 are complete idiots by today's standards. There were some good doctors, but they were actually kind of kept from him by this quack whose first name was actually Doctor. The doctors attempted to extract a bullet from Garfield's body by sticking their unwashed hands into his back. When that didn't work, Alexander Graham Bell actually showed yep. up with a portable metal detector that he had invented specifically to find the bullet. But they couldn't find it because Dr. Bliss, the lead physician... Who, his name was actually Dr. Bliss, so you could actually say his name was Dr. Dr. Bliss. Doctor was actually a pretty common first name for people in the 19th century. Insisted that the bullet was in Garfield's right side and didn't let Bell use his device on the president's left side where the bullet actually was. I think he was also on a bed with metal springs and that interfered with it. Was. And while they were all probing for the bullet on the wrong side of the president's body, one doctor even punctured Garfield's liver. Ultimately, the president died from his wounds becoming infected yep. and developing sepsis, but only after 11 agonizing weeks of improper medical care. To put that in perspective, Garfield's entire presidency prior to being shot was less than 13 weeks. It's now widely believed that Garfield could have easily survived the shooting were it not for the incredibly incompetent doctors that were treating him. 100%. Which means 100%, that Charles sure. Gateau was such a failure that he couldn't even kill an unguarded man from a few feet away without the help of 19th century medical care. Honestly, antibiotics would have saved two of the four. McKinley would have survived as well if they had had the ability to treat his infection. Speaking of Gateau, he was immediately arrested after the assassination and was ultimately sentenced to death for the murder of the president. Although they couldn't charge him with that for almost three months as they waited for the medical malpractice to kick in. Yep. On the day of his hanging, Gateau danced his way up to the gallows and shook hands with his executioner. He read a poem too. As his final request, he read a poem to the crowd in front of him, which he had written that morning. It was called, I am going to the Lordy, and people in the crowd described his delivery as both sad and doleful and high-pitched and childlike. Say what you want about the guy, but he had an undeniable stage presence. And the also an undeniable case of mental illness. 
third president to be assassinated was William McKinley, who was shot in New York in September of 1901. Unfortunately, his assassin was a lot less interesting and had a name that was much harder to pronounce. Leon Cholgosh. Here's the name. Take a moment to read that. Any guesses? It's Cholgosh. Sometimes I think the Polish language was designed to make English speakers embarrass themselves. Anyway, Leon Cholgosz. So a little irony with Cholgosz, he actually uh, <clears throat> lived in Cleveland, Ohio for a while. So also a Northeast Ohio connection uh, there. And his father lived until like the end of World War II. Uh, just kind of a weird thing. His dad was like 100 years old when he died. I think he was a Polish immigrant. Gosh lost his job at a steel mill during an economic depression known as the Panic of 1893. Yep. Entering a depression of his own, he turned to anarchism. At the time, anarchism was growing in popularity among the youth. And yeah, and there were actually a number of assassinations of world leaders around this time uh, perpetrated by anarchists. And had recently inspired someone in Italy to assassinate King Umberto yep. the First. I suppose every generation has their trends. Leon joined an anarchist group in Chicago, but his social awkwardness caused the members of the group to declare him a spy. I guess hmm. they thought he was working for the greatest enemy of the anarchists, functioning members of society. Cholgosh convinced himself that killing the president would help advance the anarchist cause, which might have been true if he also killed every single person in the presidential line of succession. At the time, McKinley was six months into his second term, having easily won re-election after guiding the nation out of the 1893 depression. Meaning Leon was so disgruntled about the state of the economy that he was going to kill the guy who fixed it. So he went to Buffalo, New York, where a World's Fair called the Pan American Exposition was taking place. Which is strange, because you'd think that if you're trying to show off the achievements of mankind, the last place you'd want to do it is Buffalo, New York. Either way, McKinley was speaking at the exposition and was doing a meet and greet afterwards, hiding his gun under a handkerchief. Yeah, so this is a picture taken, I mean, think literally moments before McKinley was shot at a place called the Temple of Music, which no longer exists. And actually, if you go to the site where McKinley was assassinated today, it's in a residential neighborhood, and there's a the road that runs through the residential neighborhood, there's a little strip of grass in the middle of the two lanes. You have to walk into the middle of the street, and there's a little rock there, and that's where McKinley was assassinated. Which if, Leon approached McKinley, who reached out to shake his assassin's hand. Leon reportedly slapped the president's hand out of the way and shot him twice in the abdomen. Feels like slapping the hand out of the way was a bit unnecessary, but maybe he didn't want to leave McKinley hanging. The first bullet actually ricocheted off the president's coat button, and props to his tailor on that one, but the second one hit him in the stomach. Leon Cholgosh was immediately tackled by the crowd, who began beating him. This prompted McKinley to yep. tell the members of the crowd, go easy on him, boys. And you know they were kicking his ass if the guy he just shot was telling them to calm down. It's kind of ironic here because a very similar story happens. McKinley's vice president is Theodore Roosevelt, and that's how he becomes president, becomes the youngest president in American history. Um, but years later, when Roosevelt is running for re-election, well, not re-election at that point, he's running for a third term um, in 1912, he gets shot in Milwaukee. And he has kind of the same response. He, he shouts for the crowd not to beat the crap out of the guy who had just shot him. On his way to the exhibition hospital, McKinley reached into his clothing and pulled out a piece of metal, saying, I believe that is a bullet. Thankfully, it was the bullet that had ricocheted off his coat, and he wasn't just reaching into his open wound. <laughs> the president was promptly operated on by the only available surgeon, OB who was a gynecologist. Yep. He sewed up the president's wounds, and it was thought for a few days that McKinley would make a full recovery. True. But even though medicine had improved in the 20 years since Garfield's death, they still hadn't quite mastered the art of basic hygiene, and the president's wounds had not been thoroughly cleaned. As a result, gangrene developed in his stomach, and he died eight days after being shot. Another win for America's greatest assassin, unwashed hands. Leon Cholgosh was tried in court for first-degree murder. He actually pled guilty, but the judge overruled him and entered a not guilty plea instead. I guess he just wanted to keep the case interesting. The attorney assigned to defend Leon spent most of the case telling the jury how great McKinley was, just so that nobody would think that he was actually defending the person he was supposed <laughs> to defend. 
But Who wants to be the guy that gets stuck defending the killer of a president? So you can see what he's trying to do there. But perhaps the greatest defense of Cholgosh came from William McKinley himself, who said while on the operating table, he didn't know, poor fellow, what he was doing. He couldn't have known. Hmm. It's easy to see why wow. the nation mourned the death of McKinley so heavily, as he was widely beloved. He, he's often thought to be one of our most religious presidents. He was a deeply committed Christian. And so, it, you know, whatever, say whatever you want about McKinley's policies. And there are a lot of people that take issue with his policies. And that's fine. Uh, but as a person, he seems to, I mean, that seems very consistent with his character that he would have that kind of an attitude even towards somebody who had shot him. Still, his life and presidency were soon mostly overshadowed by his vice president and successor, yep. Theodore Roosevelt who was thrust into the presidency at the age of 42, practically an infant by today's standards. Yeah, no Cholgosh kidding. was sentenced to death and was executed by electric chair in October of 1901. But there was someone else at the Pan American Exposition who should have Robert at least Todd been Lincoln. investigated. None other than Robert Lincoln. No, I'm not kidding. Robert Lincoln was genuinely there that he day, was. standing outside the building that McKinley was shot in. Clearly the man was a walking curse. And he apparently realized this, declining all future invitations to meet subsequent presidents. But after having some kind of involvement with three presidential assassinations, he really should have just fled the country entirely. 36 years he was present for three presidential assassinations. Imagine that. Uh, and like I said, he, he did end up eventually being around another president, and that president died in office like a year later. Maybe go use the curse for good and hang out around 12-year-old Hitler for a while. Somehow, it was only after the McKinley assassination that the government decided the president should have permanent security. Yep. Third time's the charm, I guess. But it obviously didn't do much to help the fourth president on our list, John F. Kennedy. In case you didn't know, he was killed in Dallas, Texas on November 22, 1963. Obviously, with how recent this assassination was, there's a lot more information available about it. And yet... That and the fact that it was recorded on video. Somehow, it's the biggest mystery of all of them. And literally every possible aspect of this assassination has been analyzed to the tiniest detail. So I can't possibly talk about all of it, but I'll try to give you a summary. Yeah, and if you want a great look at at least one aspect of this, uh, Lamino's uh, series, or I guess video on uh, the Kennedy assassination, which I did as I think a four-part uh, reaction series, uh, is really, really well done. All his stuff is top-notch. What we know for sure is that Kennedy was shot while driving in a convertible limousine, accompanied by his wife Jackie, Texas Governor John Connolly, and the governor's wife Nellie. And that's pretty much the only thing I can guarantee. The primary suspect, of course, is Lee Harvey Oswald, a former U.S. Marine who had defected to the Soviet Union in 1959 at the age of 20. He entered the country with a visa valid for only a week, but declared his intention to become a Soviet citizen which prompted several Soviet officials to question him, reportedly finding his wish incomprehensible. And the fact that Soviet officials couldn't even fathom a U.S. citizen wanting to live in Russia pretty much tells you everything you need to know about why America won the Cold War. Still, Oswald was determined to move there, even going to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow and unofficially renouncing his American citizenship, saying, I have made up my mind, I'm through. But only 15 months later, Oswald wrote in his diary that he regretted moving there, complaining about the lack of nightclubs or bowling <laughs> alleys. Might have been smart to at least flip through a travel brochure before renouncing his citizenship. Yeah, maybe. But the U.S. government didn't really care about Oswald one way or another, so they let him and his Russian wife Marina move back to the U.S. in 1962. The next year, he was working at the Texas School Book Depository in Dallas which is where he allegedly killed JFK. And this is another one of those ones that turns out to be kind of a crime of opportunity. Uh, he didn't get the job at the school book depository thinking this will be an opportunity to kill the president. He happened to be working there, and they found out that the presidential motorcade, when he came to Dallas in November, was going to go right past their building. Shooting a rifle from the sixth floor as the presidential motorcade drove by. Kennedy's final interaction was with Nellie Connolly, who said, Mr. President, they can't make you believe now that there are not some in Dallas who love and appreciate you, can they? Which is one of the most strangely worded sentences I've ever heard. I've never heard it worded that way. I think I've heard the sentence before, but I, 
Is that how it was really worded? Interesting. Sounds like a six-year-old telling you a story. The president replied, no, they sure can't. Presumably after taking a minute to process what the hell she was talking about. Moments later, he was shot in the throat yeah. and head, killing him relatively quickly. Which is a blessing for JFK, since we know that if the bullets hadn't killed him, the medical care would have. Governor John Connolly... If you want a, uh, a great look at that whole aspect, the medical care and everything, uh, the movie Parkland is fantastic. Great actors, great story, really well done. ...was also wounded, but recovered from his injuries and thankfully did not go on to kill his wife in Germany. Oswald fled the depository. He did, however, become a Republican later in life. And if you, I don't know if there's much of it left, but at one time he was Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, and you can actually find, you could find his signature on money that was made during that time. And got onto a bus, returning home. But a couple hours later, he allegedly shot and killed a police officer who was questioning him. I have to say allegedly for pretty much all of this, because otherwise someone in the comments will tell me I'm an idiot and this yep, was all really done yep, by Ted yep. Cruz's father. But we do know that Oswald was arrested a little bit later at a movie theater nearby, after someone spotted him trying to hide from police and slipping into the theater without paying. And he legit pulled out a gun and tried to shoot the cops there too, by the way. And if he was willing to do that crime, we might as well chalk the other ones up to him too. Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson was also in Dallas and boarded Air Force One after Kennedy was declared dead. He was urged to return to the White House but refused to leave without Jackie Kennedy. And one of the only presidents who was not sworn in on a Bible. I don't think they had one available. They did like it was some kind of a prayer book or some some Catholic book of some kind. With it later being reported that he did not want to be remembered as an abandoner of beautiful widows. But I guess ugly widows are on their own. After Jackie got on the plane, LBJ was sworn in as president. I, I, I never knew the full story behind how this came to be this way, but, but making that woman, st and maybe it was her choice, but having Jackie stand next to the man while he was sworn in to me is just the cruelest of things as far as I'm concerned. But maybe it was her choice. I know she chose to keep the, the clothes on she was wearing uh, intentionally. Maybe she wanted to, to stand there for that. I don't know. Returning to D.C. with the weirdest answer to how was your trip that anyone has ever had. Just two days later, Oswald was being escorted to a car at the Dallas police headquarters when he was shot by Jack Ruby, a local nightclub owner. And Ruby was an eccentric guy to say the least, known for his volatile temper. He was the bouncer of his own club and beat his customers on at least 25 occasions. At that point, it sounds like owning the club was simply a means for him to assault random people on the Could street. Be. Ruby was missing an index finger because someone he fought outside oh, his club bit the finger so hard that they had to amputate wow. it. Ruby was also known for sometimes taking off his shirt or other clothes in social situations before pounding his chest like a gorilla and rolling around on the floor. So, you know, I know people love to go with conspiracy theories on Ruby shooting Oswald, but maybe that's just who he was. He definitely seems like the kind of guy who would take matters into his own hands in a situation like this. So naturally, his motive has been extensively questioned for decades. Ruby himself said that he killed Oswald to spare Jackie Kennedy the pain of witnessing Oswald's trial. Couldn't believe that. Instead, opting to give her no closure on the death of her husband for the rest of her life. Ruby also said that he wanted to show the world that Jews have guts, since he was Jewish himself. And I'm sure Jews across the country are so thankful that he pulled like them into this too. Ruby was originally <laughs> sentenced to death, which was then overturned, but he died of a pulmonary embolism while in prison awaiting a retrial. Yeah, not, not e just barely three, a little over three years later. Maybe the strangest part of this all is that the government chose to keep using the same limousine that Kennedy was assassinated in until 1977. Really? But I have to assume they kept the roof up. The Kennedy assassination has been the subject of thousands of conspiracy theories over the years. Perhaps my favorite one is the theory that Oswald was aiming for Governor Connolly and accidentally hit the president. Oops. Whoops. Even Oswald's widow, who's still alive today, eventually believed Oswald wasn't responsible. A number of people and organizations are theorized to be behind the killing, such as the CIA, the FBI, Fidel Castro, the KGB, the Mafia, and LBJ himself. But there's one person that they're all forgetting about, Robert Lincoln. 
He did die 37 years prior, but it's worth looking into off the track record alone. And those are some of the odd details behind all four U.S. presidential assassinations. So that was really well done, and, and I like he... Maybe the humor to me wasn't always appropriate, but I like that he injected some humor into it and, and gave some lighthearted moments. I think you probably have to do that, so I at least appreciate him going that route a little bit with it. So as we wrap this up, uh, like I said, i put some links down in the description uh, as well as up on the screen at the end to check some other videos I've done related to this topic as well as to the original. Uh, Anthony in Duluth, Minnesota. I've been to Duluth, cool little town. Uh, thank you so much for your support on Patreon as well as Owen uh, in York. York Pickering, it says, uh, in the UK. Uh, love York. Been to York several uh, Spent several days in York and absolutely loved it and definitely want to go back at some point. Thank you both so much for your support on Patreon. Couldn't do it without you. Thanks for watching.